And amen. amen. Go ahead and praise the Lord again. Thank God for this ensemble, his music. Come on, praise the Lord. What a blessing. We're in a series of messages that we entitled Risk, Dare to Live the New Life. And uh, hopefully that you have uh, been doing just that very, very thing. And once we come to Christ, we are new creatures in Christ. We're not what we used to be. We're a completely new kind of creature on the, on the face of the planet that is born again, birthed into a new life, and that new life is Jesus, and that's just part of who we are. As we get into this, this is the last of the four in the series of messages that I'm dealing with this particular topic. And as we get into today, I'm going to talk about what we might call some, some myths or some excuses today, all right, why people don't live the new life. I think the best way to start, you're plugged in back there with the audio and everything. Let me just give you this little brief video clip. As Christians, when people bring up the topic of evangelism, what do you think that means? Well, in my experience, people usually end up in one of two camps. Camp one says you need to talk about Jesus and live a life that's consistent with what you believe. And camp two says, all you have to do is live a good life. It'll speak for itself. Well... First of all, it's a big jump to assume that anyone can live a good life, don't you think? I mean, Romans 3, 10 through 11 says, none is righteous, no, not one, no one does good, not even one. But that doesn't convince you. In Mark 10, a man comes up to Jesus and kneels down before him and says, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus responds promptly with, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. Now, not only was Jesus subtly claiming to be God here, he's making it pretty clear that nobody is good except for him, hence the no one is good part. But this is the sideshow to the main event, folks, so step right up and let's get down to it. And let's assume when Camp 2 says good life, they just mean if you live a visible godly life, people will just by watching watching you understand all they need to know about God. Okay, let's play that out, shall we? And let's ask Bruce if he can help us. Hey, Bruce, hey. So Bruce grabs a Mormon, a Jehovah's Witness, and a Christian, and he tells you to follow each of those folks around, and after simply watching them, you'll know all you need to know about God. Now, each goes to a place every week and sits among like-minded folks. Each person prays, each treats you with respect, each loves his family, is honest with his money, and is basically a nice person. So, which God do you pick based on just watching? Who's right? How do you know? What do you compare unless they tell you why they do what they do? Talking, it seems, becomes critical. No doubt nature reveals much about the invisible attributes of God, but how do you know exactly what he requires of you? I mean, who he really is and what his ultimate plan is without some kind of specific revelation from him. I mean, how would you know if your mother wanted you to paint the left wall of the garage red if it wasn't specifically communicated to you in some way, usually by writing a note or speaking to you? So what did God deem the best way to communicate the specifics of his will? Did he summon porpoises to do a modern dance? Did he draw word pictures in the clouds? No. To communicate precisely the things he wanted you to know, he intervened throughout history and spoke through men, ultimately moving some of them to write the Bible, that is, spoke wrote a note. How would we know if God created the heavens and the earth in six days, that Adam and Eve were created in a perfect world, but their rebellion brought sin and death into the world, that it's the grace of God through faith in Jesus alone that saves us? How would you know that Jesus died on the cross and resurrected from the grave? How would you know any detail about God and his word and his plan if nobody told us? Well, we wouldn't. We couldn't. And that's why you got to tell people things. You, you just can't hope people will catch on by watching you live a so-called good life. It's just not enough. Ultimately, you got to tell them why you live that way. But don't just take my word for it, my inquiring Berean band of misfits. Read along in Romans 10. And how can they know who to trust if they haven't heard of the one who can be trusted and how can they hear if nobody tells them? Jesus himself definitively declares in Matthew 28, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. It's kind of hard to baptize in the name of somebody without actually saying the name and it's pretty difficult to teach people to observe commandments without telling them what those commandments are, right? I mean, I could go on until my mouth falls off, but suffice to say, Christians are commanded to live a life worthy of the calling which irrefutably includes things like giving reasons and answers for our hope and engaging in a conversation about Christ. So this idea that you never have to speak out about your faith and all you have to do is live a good life and people will catch on has been debunked. Adios. Adios. <laughs> and you thought I'd talk fast. <laughs> but you got it, right? My inquiring band of Berean misfits. <laughs> that is important that we understand just what is called upon us as believers. There's so many people who want to, you know, have it your own way kind of mentality with the, with the gospel and with Christianity and with their faith. Well, I don't do that or I do this. It's kind of pick and choose mentality. And they completely miss, you know, uh, the joy that's in the Christian life, part of which is sharing my faith, telling other people what God has done in my life and who God is and what he can do in their life and how you get saved. I mean, that's all part of what we do because of who we are. 
So we do what we do because we are what we are. I mean, it's like before we get saved, we sin because we're sinners. But once we become saints, uh, we, we sin less. All right, we're not sinless, but we do sin less. But we do other things. And one of the things throughout Scripture that is highly characteristic of the Christian, the person who comes to know Christ is they speak about Jesus. They talk about the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, Jesus himself made this comment when he said, whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the son of man will be ashamed of when he comes in glory of his father, of his father with the holy angels. It's a pretty profound statement. Many times we see statements like this in scripture, zoom right over them. Sometimes because they're so convicting, uh, sometimes because we just don't pay any attention to what God's saying anyway. This is a powerful, it should be a very convicting passage. Jesus said, if you're ashamed of me. And the tragedy is that we shouldn't be ashamed of him. We have no reason to be ashamed of him. Paul went on to say later, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is the power of God. I mean, why should we be ashamed? But there's this important part of our, an, an aspect of our Christian life that we need to embrace. And that's part of the ministry and the mission. We talked about it in several messages. That we've been called to be ambassadors for the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we want to follow that out. Scripture tells in John 15, by this is my father glorified that you bear fruit and so proved to be my disciples, that you bear much fruit. Only two things are referred to in fruit in Scripture in the New Testament. One is the fruit of the Spirit. And that's really the likeness of Jesus, the character of Christ. It's all the fruit of the Spirit is just Jesus being Jesus through me. When I'm filled with the Spirit, there'll be a display of that Spirit. We call that the fruit of the Spirit, the evidence, the proof the reality of Jesus in my life. The other is in scripture talks about fruit in regard to the fact that we're making a difference in the world we live in and people are coming to know Christ as a result of our lives. So we're bearing fruit. And the Bible says as we do that, then we glorify our father, which is in heaven. You know, there's a, a, a organization, one of the Graham organizations, the Billy Graham Evangelist Association, he talks about the men's surveys that they've taken over the years. And he said, which we've helped, you know, We've taken around the world and we've discovered that about 98% of the Christians do not regularly introduce others to the Savior. Barna, George Barna says the same thing. About 98% of people who profess to know Christ never talk about Jesus, never seek to introduce Jesus to the lost world, to their friends that are lost, to their family that are lost. They, they just don't do it. Now, folks, I don't know about you, but that just blows my mind. 98%. Now, I, I, I would hope that our church, the odds are a little better than that, but I don't know that they're that much better than that, that this is a problem that we face in the world to live us, uh, that we're living in and all around us. There are people who don't know Jesus. You follow the scriptures, follow the life of Jesus. Wherever he went, he's engaging people with the gospel, all right? And he's talking about, about the Lord Jesus Christ. We have to be doing the same thing, that we're engaging people. We're cultivators in the field. He said the fields are white into harvest. But as you look at this, you know, and, and there's, the gospel records about 132 contacts that Jesus had with individuals, all right? Now, I'm not talking about the masses where thousands and tens of thousands of people gathered, but I'm talking about when he, there's 132 different people in, as we can see it in scripture. Where did he meet these people? Well, the scriptures, four gospels only record six examples of him speaking to people individually in the temple. Then it records four contacts were made in the synagogues, all right? That's the minimal amount right there. But when you read the scriptures, how many people did Jesus speak to outside, let's say, church? You have 122 different contacts that are mentioned in scripture. It's one thing that we come together and we talk about it, but the, the majority of our talking about Jesus really ought to be outside the walls. or in the world that we live in around the people that we live in. And today, I just want to give you about six or seven, what I, what I call, you know, the, the, well, they're just common excuses. And like we talked about a while ago, this one excuse that, that he debunked. These are some things that I want to debunk today, all right? And the first one has to do with the video you just saw, all right? That my life speaks. The scripture says, for since, the, since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God, God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those that believe. Now catch this, he says, first of all, since the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God. In other words, no matter what the world does, and you're expecting them to find God on their own, it's not gonna happen, all right? 
in all their great intelligence and all their great wisdom, we're still spending billions of dollars in our country to go into outer space so we can discover our origins. I could save you, just give me 1% of that and I'll tell you our origins. Shoot, I'll do it for free, <laughs> all right? All this money to discover the process of the great boom and the blast and the events that took place. Listen, people everywhere, no matter how smart they may be, are not gonna to come to the gospel other than somebody praying for them and preaching to them and telling them about it. So this idea that my life speaks is, is, is not good. The sin that we face today in the church in this regard is obviously silence. When he uses this word, God chose the foolishness of preaching, don't think that that just means a Sunday sermon. No, this is a word that basically means to communicate or to tell a message. God chose the method of talking to people to save those that are lost. Could have chosen a lot of ways, but this is the way to it. I want you to communicate with your mouth, your life, the message I've given you. If you miss that, then you miss the, the whole plan and purposes of God for your life. The second excuse is this. It's not my job. Of course, Matthew tells us in five that you know, you're the salt of the world. We've covered that, the salt of the earth, and the light of the world pretty clearly over the last couple of weeks we've talked about that issue. But we need to understand that it is our responsibility. When you look at Acts 8, when Saul's going around and dragging people to, you know, out of their homes and taking them up to be detained and to be jailed and to be killed, you know, uh, that, that chapter there we show you up on, on Acts there, it shows you about the part where it says that Saul went into their home, made havoc of the church, went into all their houses, drug out the men and the women. It says, and basically he dispersed the Christian community. And as they were dispersed, it says, therefore they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word, speaking the word. Who did it? The preachers? Well, obviously, but beyond that, well beyond that, everyone. Now, let's think about this for a moment. Here's Saul. He's coming in, dragging people out of their homes. First thing we do is run. Second thing we do is keep our mouth shut. That's not what happened, is it? They're dispersed, they're being pressured out of where they are, but as they go, they're not keeping their mouth shut. The very thing that's getting them in trouble is what they keep doing. And they keep doing it no matter where they go. So much so, you know, there's Saul, he's consenting to Stephen's death and he's continuing to go out and drag them out of their homes. God deals with him, obviously. By the way, God deals with everybody. One way or the other, we usually be faithful to do what God has called us to do. This, it's not my job. It certainly needs to be debunked. You know, there is a spiritual biology lesson that we need to learn. We know the physical biology lesson that when a man and a woman procreate, if you don't know what that means, ask your teenagers later. If, when a man and a woman <laughs> procreate and the lady becomes pregnant, she gives birth about nine months later to what? A baby. Frank's the only one that passed the test and he's not even married. <laughs> they have a baby. Why? Because people have babies. It's the natural process of life, all right? We get married. We're supposed to put that, let's get the chicken before the hens or whatever. But we get married and we have babies. Where do babies come from? Babies come from other babies that have grown up and to be adults. And they have babies, all right? That's class 101 sex, Ed. Class 101 spiritually. Where do Christians come from? Mama, where do babies come from? Maybe that mama, where do Christians come from? Well, Brother Joe has them. <laughs> Stays in labor all the time. Now, where do babies come from? They come from the parents. So where do Christians, they come from other Christians. In fact, the scripture likens the church, the Christian, to a certain animal. Does anybody know what animal in the Bible that the Bible refers to as Christians as? As what? Yeah, donkeys in some places, I know. But most of the time, sheep. All right, sheep. Guess what? Are you with me now? Brian, you taking notes over there? Write this down. Sheep have baby. Frank's right again, right. Frank. <laughs> we know what Frank does in his spare time. He studies. Sheep have what? Sheep. Dogs have what? Puppies, all right. Cats have kittens, little baby cats. Little ducks have ducks, right? Chickens have chickens. Sheep have sheep. So in the spiritual realm, it's the same truth that the sheep in the flock are the ones who procreate and have other sheep. 
Where does that come from? Well, well, we know in a man and wife, let's put it this way, let's put it in biblical terms, have fellowship. We get babies. When Christians have real fellowship with the Father, with each other, out of that comes more spiritual babies. We have spiritual babies. What's a pastor in the scripture called? A shepherd. A sheep herder, all right? He tends for he can, Yeah, pastors, obviously they win people to Jesus, but it's not the main responsibility of a pastor. It's the main responsibility if we're looking at job descriptions for the sheep to have the sheep. So whose job is it? It's the sheep. So everybody say, bad. <laughs> Very good start. The third, I call that one debunk. The third is this. I'm afraid of being rejected. You know, Billy Graham crusade, uh, they have the sessions where they train the people who are going to be working in the crusades and training the counselors and stuff. And one ask, the question they ask in their survey when they get these people prepared for it is, uh, what are your greatest hindrances to talking about Jesus or, or to sharing your faith with other people? 9% said they were too busy to remember to do it. And I would think today, I think this is about 20 year old survey, I think probably that'd be up to like 25%. You know, it's that putting your candle under the bushel, that's the mindset there. You know, the activities, we just get so preoccupied. That's why we have our wristbands. <laughs> you can wear your wristband and, and it'll help you remember to talk about Jesus for those who fall in this category. So well, I don't remember seeing it on my wrist. Put it on your forehead, you'll feel it. It's real tight, all right? It's like, can I tell you about Jesus before my head explodes, all right? <laughs> you have it there, it's a great reminder. I told somebody, put it around your wallet, you know, because you're always going in your wallet, at least I am, every time I'm out and about. It'll remind you that when you're paying for something, tell somebody about Jesus, invite somebody to church, tell them about what God's done in your life. Remember, but in the interest of nine percent, I bet I bet that's a lot busy, a lot more than today than it was at the time that survey was taken. Twenty-eight percent felt they felt the lack of real information to share, just didn't know didn't know what to say. Uh, none said they really didn't care. By the way, they all said they cared, but twelve said, percent said they their own lives just didn't speak as they should. In other words, they're kind of embarrassed to talk about Jesus because they know there's things in their life that don't honor God. You can fix that easy. Get right with God. That's an easy fix. Amen. Amen? All right. The largest group by far was the 51% who said the biggest problem they had of all was that they were afraid of how people would respond or how people would react to them. Now, obviously, nobody wants to be rejected. Nobody likes to be the oddball. Nobody wants to be ridiculed and regarded as that person that's a little bit strange. But folks, let me tell you something. We, we, you need to get over that because in reality, you are strange. Just look at the person beside you and say, you're strange. They are. Because if you're a Christian, put it this way, if you're a believer, you're, you're strange. If you're a Christian who lives for Jesus, the world's always going to look at you as weird, as different. Now, the Bible calls that a different word. It calls it holy, unique, set apart. Your life is different because God has made a difference in you. But something has to go along with that difference, and the difference is that you speak the word of God. You say, well, what, what if they reject you? Well, if they reject you, remember, it's not you they're really rejecting. It's the gospel message that they are rejecting. First Corinthians says, you know, Paul said, when I came to you, I was in weakness and in fear and much trembling. Now, this is Paul is in the middle of his missionary journeys. He'd been doing it a while. He said, when I came to you, so there's still a lot of fear and trembling in my life. You know, I'm not trying to articulate the gospel. All of us have to deal with that issue of what someone's going to say. Our pride tries to get in the way. But you just go ahead and realize that the power of what you're speaking is not you. It's in the message you're speaking, and it's the power of the cross. That's why he said, I was, I was committed to the fact, this fact right here, no matter what the fear or the weakness or the trembling might be, that I'd present Jesus Christ and him crucified, and that's the message that will make a difference in people's life. We stick to the message. Stick to the message and see what God does in people's life. The greatest sin, again, is silence. Don't worry about what people might say. Your responsibility is just to say it. Just to say it. Just, just to speak it. I mean, if I go out here today, stop somebody at the gas station, pumping gas, and somebody's beside me, and I say, hey, anybody told you about Christ there? You ever go to church anywhere? Just start a conversation, you know, and they don't get saved. Have I failed? No, I haven't failed. What if Eric goes out here, he goes over to the gas station, he's pumping gas, and he wins the next Billy Graham to Jesus? Did you get any credit for that? No. <laughs> God gets the credit for that. What'd he do? Did the same thing I did. We we're both successful. We both succeeded. You know, get away from the idea that I have to win everybody. 
And I think that really hit it. I got to win everybody. No, you don't. You just got to be faithful to proclaim the message. And to just, but don't be afraid of being rejected. This is who you are. It's what you do. I mean, the great story, the story of great D.L. Moody was out, you know, walking down one of the streets in Chicago where their church and ministry was, was headquartered. He said, I went down the street and I noticed a man leaning against a, a lamppost. And I walked up to him. I put my hand on his shoulder. And I said, sir. And the guy, you know, kind of responds. He said, sir, do, do you know, mind if I ask you if you're a Christian? The guy gets all irate, raises his fist, starts yelling at Moody. and says, you know, mind your own business. To which Moody responded, I'm sorry if I offended you, but this is my business. <laughs> This is my business. It is my business. It's, what, it's the business God gave me to do. It's the business God gave you to do. You love people. If they reject you, praise the Lord, they rejected the gospel. Don't take it personal. It's all about Christ. Amen. I'm afraid of being rejected. And, and let's take that down to a little deeper step. To not just the stranger on the street, but this kind of goes hand in hand. I'm afraid of what my friends will think. A little deeper inside the circle of acquaintances. What, what my friends think about me. Let me ask you this. Try to be honest. Uh, what do they think about you now? What do they think about you now? They just think you're a religious person. You know, you got some kind of nice code of ethics. That's nice and good. He's he's an honest guy. But where's where's God? And where's the glory of God? And where's the grace of God in in your life? If you say nothing, you remain silent. Again, that sin of silence. If people slip into hell, knowing you were a good guy, knowing you were a nice woman that you were a fair, honest person. But understand, Scripture makes it clear that we really are peculiar people. You know, so it doesn't matter at this point, you know, what people think. My, my goal is not being a people pleaser. My goal is to be a pleaser of God. Jesus said, if they persecuted me, they will persecute you. First Thessalonians 2 says this, if our exhortation, the message, our preaching does not come from error or impurity, impurity or by the way of deceit, just as we've been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. So we speak not as pleasing man, but God who examines our heart. So the issue, we're speaking not because we're concerned about making you happy or making you sad, making you mad, making you glad. We're just here to preach the gospel. And that's what we do. That's who we are. We, we take the risk. We dare to live the new life, just be what God called us to be. And we are in the context that ambassadors for Christ, messengers of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Galatians, it says, for am I now seeking, am I now seeking to prove, he says, or to, to the, seek the favor of men or of God, or am I striving to please men? If I were still trying to please men, I would not be the bond servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. So he said, what do you want to be a man pleaser for? Let's seek to be a God pleaser. You know, if, if, if you're going to be a man pleaser, if that's what you want, Popularity, be accepted by the group. I mean, that's, what, that's what's important. Fine, go that route and you'll please men. But most important is that you please God and you honor God and you exalt God with your life. He said, be a bondservant of Christ. Where do we ever get the idea that Christianity was all about me? Well, Chris, that's what's been preached for years though, hasn't it? Yeah, get saved for yourself. Get saved to help you. Get saved to make you a better person. Get saved to go to heaven. Get saved not to go to hell. And it, that's all nice. It does make me a better person. It does get me out of hell. It does move me toward heaven. But that's not the end objective here. The message Jesus gave out of his own lips, if any man will follow me, you want to be a Christian? Then you take up the cross. You deny yourself. Take up the cross and follow me. Now that's a symbol of death. That's a symbol of, of judgment. That's a symbol, symbol of rejection despised, as the scripture says, as anybody hangs on a tree. But these people responded to Jesus' message. Those disciples responded to that message of come and die so you can live. Maybe you're not familiar with how they laid down their lives. But I want you to think, as I read this list to you, think about these fact that these are men who are not ashamed of my words. Matthew, right of the gospel of Matthew, he was slain with a sword in a, in a distant city of Ethiopia, far from his own home, sharing the gospel. Mark died in Alexandria after being dragged through the streets of that city, dragged him to death. Luke was hung, hung on an olive tree in Greece. John was put in a cauldron of boiling oil. He escaped death miraculously, but then was exiled to die all alone on the island of Patmos. Peter was crucified in Rome. When the process started, he said, I would dishonor my Lord to be crucified in the same manner. And they crucified him upside down at his request. James, the greater, was beheaded at Jerusalem. 
James the Less was thrown from a pinnacle of the temple and then bludgeoned and beaten to death with clubs. Bartholomew was slayed or skinned alive is what that means. Andrew was bound to a cross where he preached to those who were persecuting him until he died on that cross. Thomas was run through the body with a lance in the East Indies. Jude was shot to death with arrows. Matthias was stoned to death and then beheaded. Barnabas was stoned to death in Salonica. Paul, after all the various tortures and persecutions at the end of his life, was at length beheaded at Rome, in Rome, by the Emperor Nero. Why? They're different. But we are different. I, I, I can't imagine meeting these men in glory one day. You know? And seeing their lives and their testimony. And by the way, Paul was beheaded by Nero. He was an insane man. People named their children Paul. They named their dogs Nero. <laughs> so you tell me who's strange. You tell me who's peculiar. You tell me who the odd person out is. Hey, if this is what it means to be odd, I'm odd. If this is what it means to be unique, I'm unique. If this is what it means to be peculiar, I want to be peculiar, distinguished. And so do you in your heart of hearts. This leads us to the next kind of myth that people embrace at this point. Well, Brad, Pastor, I, I just don't know how. Hey, that can be fixed easily, but let me show you John's method as he shares how to share the faith. Uh, what was from the beginning, here's what we heard, what we saw with our eyes, what we beheld in our hands and handled concerning the word of life. That life was manifested. Jesus was born, all right, and we saw him. And we bear witness and proclaim to you eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifest to us. What we have seen, what we've heard, Proclaim to you also that you also may have fellowship with us and indeed our fellowship with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. What's, what's Paul doing here? He's just sharing his testimony. What do we do when we witness? We just share a testimony. Here's what we know. Here's what God did in my life. Here's what God I've experienced in my own heart. This is what the Lord Jesus did for me. And if he did it for me, he'll do it for anybody. So we speak the word. Even if we don't do it good, even if we do it badly, as someone might be standing around to judge our presentation, even if we may even stutter or make some kind of mistake, listen, God uses all that. But one thing he cannot use and will not use is our silence. So we speak. What do we speak? Here's what the Lord did for me. Which brings me to the next myth. I really don't know enough. Mark says this, talking about the maniac of the gathering. Do you remember that guy? Got run through the tombs naked. When he was coming to the ship, he's fully clothed now, he that had been possessed with the devil, prayed to him, talking to Jesus, that he might be with him. Can I go with you? And Jesus suffered him not, said, but said unto him, go home to your friends. Tell them how great things the Lord hath done for thee and hath had compassion on thee. And he departed and began to publish in Decapolis how great things Jesus had done for him. And all the men did marvel. What's he saying here? Here's the guy with no education. Here's a guy for the last years of his life been running around buck naked in the cemetery gashing himself with stones. He's out of his mind. Here's a guy who meets Jesus and in an instant is changed, transformed. And he says to Jesus, I want to travel with you guys. Can I go with y'all? And Jesus said, no, I have a ministry for you. You go tell your friends what's happened to you. Now, I'm sure that as soon as he shows up, most everybody said, what happened to you? <laughs> That's how radical it was. There's the opportunity. What happened to you? But he, the changed life is obviously starts the testimony off. Now, he doesn't have an education. He doesn't have seminary training. He hasn't been through, you know, Christian witness training, evangelism, explosion, or any of the other things we do. He hasn't been given any tracks, wristbands. <laughs> He just has a testimony. You go tell what happened to you. And he says he goes to the Decapolis. You know what that means? Ten cities. He started a preaching venue. Ten cities to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Who doesn't know enough? Well, he certainly doesn't know enough. Does he? Yes, he does. He knows he's been changed. As John said, what we've seen, what we've handled, what we, we're just telling you what happened to us. That's what a reborn said. Can I tell you what happened to me? Let me tell you what's phenomenal about that. What happened to you? And this is where, especially those who know us, we say, you know, you, you may not really know who I am and where I come from, but let me tell you what, what it used to be and what God's done in my life now. And you take the opportunity, but you can't say, I don't know enough. Let me, let me tell you a story about a guy named Nate. This is a true story. Of course, I think all of them are true. I didn't say anything to lie yet. I always a little bother when people say, let me tell you something honestly. What have you been telling me before? Yeah. <laughs> 
Can I say something honestly? Well, hopefully, yes. This is a guy named Nate, brilliant guy. You know, and uh, if this guy was in your life, he'd be one of those guys that you would look at at atheists and say, you know, I just don't have what it takes. You know, how are you going to share a, a man uh, with a man like Nate who tested in the upper one percentile in the intelligence testing, IQ testing? Nate reads about 1,250 words a minute with total recall. He's a genius, genius. This guy is so bright that he not only scored one of the highest scores on the Mensa test, a test for geniuses, he also found an error in the test. <laughs> He's sharp, all right? Imagine this guy. He's a hard case. As an adult of 20 years, he's been going through his life. His hobby was to tear apart religions and religious beliefs, although he'd never really spent any time attacking Christianity. He's a genius. So who does God send to reach Nate? Does he send somebody like a Lee Strobel who's written some books on apologetics and how to know what Christianity is all about and how, how we know that the Bible's true and how we know that God is this? And does he send somebody like Josh Medall who wrote that great book, Evidence That Demands a Verdict? No. He sends a guy named John. John's a Blackfoot Indian with a 12th grade education to be a messenger of the gospel to Nate the brilliant guy. Now, Nate's living in a time when you're drafted into the armed service, and he goes, and he's in the military, and this is where he meets John, the Blackfoot Indian with a 12th grade education. Now, John was always the brunt of jokes from the other soldiers because he unashamedly lived his faith before the other guys. And, well, you guys have been in the military. You know, that, you know how that could go. Whenever he got on the bus, moving from one training place to another, he'd always have his Bible with him to read. Well, they'd come in, take his Bible, throw it out the window. Everybody's getting on the bus. John would get up, go out of the bus, pick up his Bible, come back in, sit down, start reading again. Well, Nate was sitting beside John watching this all go on, and he asked him, why do you let these clowns do that to you, man? To which John says, hey, I'm a believer. I love the Lord Jesus Christ, and I'm a Christian, and, you know, I know that people are not going to understand that. Now, up until this point, Nate's never really gone after Christians and their commitment and their faith and their religion. So he starts hammering away at big John tries to just start shredding him of his belief system. He has stuff like that. Now, come on, John, do you really believe that somebody got vomited out of the mouth of a whale? Simple John said, yes, I believe that. Come on, man, why do you believe that? Because my Bible tells me that happened. Every question came back like that. Well, that's, well yeah, I know what you're saying, but this is what the Bible says. The Bible says this. My Bible tells me that. And that was his answer. My Bible tells me that. I, I believe the Bible. Nate is so confounded by it all, he goes home that night, gets a Bible, finds a Bible, and begins to read through it through the weekend. And over the weekend when he finished reading, one thing keeps sticking out in his mind. Remember, he has a recall of when he reads. It's Job chapter 5, verse 9. He can't escape it. And here's what it says. God performs wonders that cannot be fathomed and miracles that cannot be counted. God performs wonders that cannot be fathomed, and miracles that cannot be counted. And Nate cannot get that out of his mind, and he got to the point he couldn't ignore the truth. Ultimately, his life is transformed and changed as he himself commits his life to Christ. Here's just John reaches Nate. I remember when I was in sales and retail market right out of high school. I was being trained by a salesman. And one of the things he always told me, said, never judge a book by its, by, by its cover, you know. Don't think when somebody walks in here that's driving a Cadillac that that's who you're going to sell to versus somebody else. And we were, we, I, I was assigned to my training up in a store in Farmington, New Mexico, if you know where that is. That's Navajo country, you know. He says, I want to show you something. He says, going to be one of these Indians are going to come in here in a minute, and they're going to buy an appliance. And he says, some of these salesmen aren't going to go buy them. I'm not going to talk to them because, you know, they just don't think they can afford one anyway, coming off the reservation. He said, but I guarantee you, I can go over there and sell them appliances. Because they want to buy an appliance. I said, well, they don't even have electricity. He said, that doesn't matter. They got a big government check, they need to do something with it. <laughs> he said, they buy appliances. They want an appliance. So go sell them appliance. Don't judge the book by its cover. Listen, same thing in your Christian life. Don't you think that somebody already knows or is going to reject you right off? You don't know. You don't know. You don't know the sovereignty of God. I can't see past the veil of the flesh to see what God's been already doing in their life. I don't know what God's been working out in their circumstance and in their situation, but I can be sure that if God told me to say something, he's up to something. 
God's impressed me to do something. He's up to something. I may be the first seed sown or I may be the one picking the fruit off the tree that's already grown. But God's doing something. And if we fail by the sin of silence, then we miss it completely. It's that mindset, which, which is the last of the myths here, that people already know the gospel. No, they don't. People don't know the gospel. We live in America. God, we trust. People in America have no idea who God is. You know, the church is so drifted. If, if only 98%, you know, I mean, 98% is not telling anybody, you can be sure nobody knows. I used to walk around. I think Cherry was telling me a couple years ago she was at the mall and her little girl asking her mom about that manger scene in the, in the retail store window. What is that all about? Didn't even know what Christmas was about. That's where we are in the world today. People don't know the gospel. They don't know it. They, don't, they, know, about, they know about church. They know about religion. They know about the Ten Commandments. You know, they know all those. But they don't, they don't know the gospel. They don't know it until you tell them. I, there's probably people here in this room right now that think you know the gospel that don't know it. You think you know it. You think you understand it, but you don't. I've talked to people, countless people, over the 40 years of ministry I have. Many of the years of ministry, 16 of them were spent just in this very issue of bringing people to Jesus Christ in evangelism, in revivals, in crusades, in training people in evangelism, in street ministry, in schools, in colleges, in campuses, anywhere we could go. And you'd be surprised how many people with religious backgrounds didn't have any context of what the gospel is really all about or had become so hardened by being in church that they didn't comprehend it. I mean, over and over again, Monroe, Louisiana, in a crusade, there is one of those student churches. You know, it's, a, it's a big church by the, by the campus up there at Monroe. And uh, there's a, Louisiana, one of the state colleges there. And hundreds of students, and you know, it's a big church. And I finished preaching, I think the second service, or three services that morning, the thing was so big. Second service, I remember between the service, lady came up to me, she was all decked out, looked like she's very wealthy, had lots of money, had all the diamonds and jewelry on, you know, very attractive woman. She came and she says, you know, and she had tears coming down her face. She said, listen, you know, I've sat in church all my life. You know, and I've heard all my life that I'm a sinner. People got that kind of information. But she said, I never really realized I was a sinner. Until today, I preached on the cross that morning. Until today, when you preach that message on the cross, if anybody asked me if I was, I said, well, I'm a little sinner. I sin a little. So it doesn't take much of, this was the words, it doesn't take, didn't take much of the blood of Jesus to save me because I'm just a little sinner. She said, see how arrogant that was and how ignorant I was and today I'm going to give my life to Jesus Christ. A religious woman, Alice, Texas. Anybody know where Alice, Texas is? A little church in Alice, Texas, preaching Sunday morning, a little 78, 80-year-old woman comes down now, gives her heart to Jesus, and before the service, she says, can I talk to everybody and say just a word because most people here know me. She'd given her heart to Christ. She stood before that congregation. She said, you know, everybody here knows me. I've taught Sunday school. I've been in this church. You know, I've, I've taught Sunday school to you. And when you were a child, I've taught Sunday school. When you were a teenager and you're an adult, I've taught Sunday school to some of y'all. All my life, I have played church. All my life, I've been religious. But I've never really come to the place in my life to give my heart and turn my life over to Jesus Christ. Never done that. Anybody else would look at her and say, oh, there's a Christian. She teaches Bible study. But from her own mind, she said, oh, there have been times when God began to convict me over the years, but my heart just kept getting harder and harder and harder. I kept shutting him out because I was afraid of what you would say if I gave my life to Jesus. But today, I don't care what anybody says. I'm giving my life right. I'm giving my life right. I'm giving my life to Christ. That has happened countless times through the years. At the same time, countless times that people are just on the streets, Grown up in the good old USA. And my mama thought, you know, before she ever got saved, if you're, in, if you're born American, you're born a Christian. And that was her testimony. I just thought I was Christian because I'm an American. Now, seriously, that was her mindset. Most of her life, she said, what? what do you mean I'm a Christian? I'm a, I got a passport, U.S. <laughs> got a driver's license, Texas. I'm a Christian. Everybody knows you live in Texas, you're saved. <laughs> That's almost true, but it's not true. <laughs> People like that just, you know, and, and come to give their life to Jesus Christ when they fully understand, hey, we're separated from God by our sin. Yeah. Listen, this is the gospel. See if it applies to you. You're separated from God. There's nothing you will ever do in your life to make yourself acceptable to God. You can't be baptized enough. You can't be sprinkled enough. You can't be confirmed enough. You can't go to church enough. It's just not going to happen. You're going to die. You're going to go to hell. Except someone stepped into time and eternity. God sent his son who so loved you and so loved the world that God gave his only begotten son. 
Jesus died on the cross to pay the price for your sins because you can't pay it. It's because it's death. So he dies your death. And he rose from the dead on the third day. And he offers salvation to everyone who will lay down their pride, turn from their sin, turn to Christ, and believe, and you'll be saved. That hadn't happened in your life. You say, when have you? September 27th, 1973, Thursday night, about 8.30. I gave my heart to Christ. 21 years of age. What an idiot. I was raised under the sound of the gospel, still lost. I mean, if you could get it by osmosis, I'd been twice saved. Double saved. Triple saved. Some of y'all knew my mom, right? <laughs> Just being around her. I'd been real saved. It doesn't work that way. You must be born again. You must be born again. You say, well, Brother Joe, I don't, I don't remember what day it was. You know, I often, she was in the early service, I don't see her in this service yet. I just said, I often forget what day I was married on. Anybody ever do that? Now, it's not that I forget what month, I, I remember the month. But it was the 10th or was it the 11th? And I go through this almost every year, but I trick it out of her so I don't have to worry about it anymore. Always accusing her of getting the date wrong. No, it was on such a time. I'm from to tell you, you know, you're right, okay. <laughs> but you know what? I know I'm married. Amen. Amen. And I remember the day I got married. I remember standing at the altar. I remember watching her come down the aisle. I know what she was wearing. I know what she was saying. I was there. It happened. Now, 10th or 11th, that's incidentals. But I'm married. Bless God, and I know it. I'm saved. I might not remember September 27th or the 30th or August or September, but I know the day I, gave, I remember giving my life to Jesus. If that hadn't happened for you, if it's not a personal relationship with you, why, what are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? You say, well, I can't live that kind of life. You can't. You got that right. But he can, and he comes in and gives you the power to live that kind of life. Nicodemus is a great illustration. Religious man among the religious men. Still couldn't comprehend the truth that was standing right there before him. Acts, we see the story of Lydia. She was a worshiper of God, it says, but she didn't know Jesus. She didn't know the answer. She didn't know the, the ultimate. There's a lot of people who are God inclined, but they need to know Christ because he is the way, he is the truth, he is the life. You're a little, little late and forward. I mentioned the Billy Graham Association a while ago. Late and forward is one of the associate evangelists to Billy Graham over the years. And he talks about, he gave this little checklist that he says, I personally go through when I be, begin to get conscious of, or uh, remember there's this fear, perhaps a uh, failure. That's what's holding me back. He said, I, I go through this checklist. He says, first of all, he says, does this fear, does it come from uh, basically from pride? I mean, a fear that I, that I go through a, a kind of, you know, a, a expectation what somebody else is going to think about me. Is that what I'm dealing with? So check that off. It doesn't matter what people think about you. All right? Second thing he says, do I remember that God has called me first to faithfulness and then to efficiency? Yeah, I can get better as I go. <laughs> Most important thing, I'm just faithful. That's what God called me, just to be faithful. Third thing he says, do I trust the Holy Spirit's working before me, with me, through me? He said, now it's starting to deal with the issue of fear being dismissed. And he said, do I remember that I'm called to be neither more nor less successful than Jesus Christ was? I'm not supposed to be any less successful. I'm not supposed to be any more successful. I'm supposed to be faithful as Jesus Christ was faithful to the message. Do I remember that God does his greatest work when I seem to be weakest? Isn't that, after all, the mystery of the cross? If I'm feeling like I can't, that's the best time and place because that means God will if you'll step out and obey him. So many people who, who miss the beauty of the cross and the message of the cross, and it's tragic because they just want share it. They just miss it, the beauty of the cross and the message of the cross in their life because they won't share it. They won't tell it. I would say today, you fall in one or two camps. You say, what are they? He talked about two camps of your life showing up. You have to speak up. Let's give two different camps. The camp of, I really am saved and I really never give my life to Christ. All right? Now, if you don't share Christ and you're over here and I'm, because you've never given your life to Christ, that's understandable. But today, if you'll give your heart to Christ, it starts right here. Because the Bible says you believe with your heart and you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord. That's why we give invitations in, in church services so that people can come and express their faith in Jesus and make that first confession. I've, I've trusted Jesus as my Lord and Savior. The other camp is Christians. 
And in that group, there's this little line goes down the middle. Those who talk about Jesus and those who don't talk about Jesus. If you don't talk about Jesus, probably because of one of the five, six, seven things I just mentioned there. All right? So what do you do? Well, the Bible says our sin, you know, obviously it speaks to the fact that our sin is, is our, our silence. So I need to start speaking up. Our first place to start is really at the cross. Just come back to the cross. Ask God to forgive you for that in your life. And that, folks, I want you to know this is a work that I, I kind of go through cyclical with it. I'll get to a place where I just I quit doing it for a while, you know, and I get so preoccupied and other stuff and things and ministry even it gets get you, you know, you just get tired and sometimes. And uh, my bu- my light, my lamp is hid under that bushel of busyness. Sometimes it's hid under the bushel of laziness, slothful. What do you have to do? We have to repent of that. That's sin. That's a hindrance to everything Jesus died for, isn't it? He died to save the lost. I don't want to be a hindrance to that. You don't want to be a hindrance to that. Let's get right with God. And this morning, this invitation is given. I pray you'll come to this altar today. I need to get that right with God and start dealing with these issues in my own heart and life. Be faithful to the Lord. If you're here without Christ, you need to come. There'll be about five men to be standing here in the altar. You can come to either one of us and say, listen, I'm giving my life to Jesus today. I don't care what my people may say or think or do. If I died right now, I'd die and go to hell without Jesus. How's your life working without him? It's not, is it? Things will fall apart. Your marriage will fall apart. Your family, your situations, separation between husbands and wives, children and parents, parents and children. It just, it's just, the way it just sends always death. So you come to Christ. Be united to him and let him begin to unite your life and put it together properly. Let's stand with our heads bowed. It's a simple invitation today. Even as the band comes, I'd encourage you to step out and come. Come find a-